listening to The Cayman Show, sponsored by Anchor. Now, if you've not heard of Anchor, let me tell you a little bit about it. This is the easiest way, single-handedly, to make a podcast. Let me explain a little something to you. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many, many more. And with that said, if that isn't enough, you can make money from your Anchor podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast, and it's all in the one place. Get yourself down to Anchor right now. Anchor.fm, also available on the App Store. You won't regret it. Woohoo! Ladies and gentlemen, you are once again in tune with The Cayman Show. You can find us on Twitter at The Cayman Show. You can find us on Facebook, The Cayman Show. You can find us anywhere you like, hashtag The Cayman Show. Or you can email the show, caymanshow69 at gmail.com. Let's get it on. Welcome everyone once again to The Cayman Show. Clearly, people just can't get enough of The Cayman Show, as is evident, as goes for our guests as well, which brings me on to this individual, my newest and bestest Scottish cousin, back by popular demand after having a, a cracking show and a cracking conversation with him a couple of weeks ago about his book, Heroin to Hero. It gives me great pleasure once again to introduce to you, talking a little more in depth about one of the stories in particular, hopefully, that he mentions in his book. Uh, I'm going to give to you right now, ladies and gentlemen, live on the Cayman Show, Mr. Paul Bogey. Here we go. Cool. So joining me again today, folks, ladies and gentlemen, is the author of the magnificent book, Heroin the Hero, Mr. Paul Bogey. Spoke to him a few weeks ago about his story. Great to have you back on. We got cut short. I felt I could talk to you all day, all night or whatever last time. Um, and to be honest, I feel like I've known you for years now, mate, to be honest. But uh, welcome back anyway. It's good to have you back on board. Thanks very much for having me absolute pleasure the pleasure is all mine so how have things been since we last spoke mate how have things been going yeah things have been going really well i just been on social media trying to raise awareness of the book standard for the last year um yeah you know during lockdown i can't really get out so i've got loads of posters made up i've got loads of shops willing to put the poster in the shop window for me so hoping that that's going to help with book sales as well yeah so just chipping away excellent stuff mate excellent now nah, good to you man good to you how have book sales been going they've been going going well yeah steady i'm i'm, I'm selling books every day so i won't grumble um yeah. i always feel like you know I could sell more. I want to sell more because all the profits are for homelessness in Scotland. You know, I I'm driven to try and sell as many books every day as I can. Mm. But I'm I'm so limited. I don't have a publisher. I don't have a marketing team who you know can help. I basically right now I have social media. Yeah, it's it's a great platform though, and it when used correctly, you know. Yeah, it's free. Exactly, exactly. It don't come much freer than that, does it? It don't come much better than that. No, exactly. Brilliant, mate. Brilliant. I've, I've been that. Obviously, I've been following you. I've been keeping an eye on you. I've. Uh, I see you've had a. You've been up against the weather up there as well recently. Is that right? Yeah, the snow has been really bad. I've not seen it this bad, that far as far back as I can remember, um, and it's just sort of thawing out now. We had rain yesterday which helped and hopefully that is going to be the last but I wouldn't be surprised if we get another another snowfall before the winter's ended yeah no, God knows, God knows it's been cold enough mate, I, I think you had uh, record lows the other week didn't you, or the other day yeah it's absolutely freezing and of course for me 
right now. It's just such a shame because homeless people are out there trying to cope with not only being homeless, not only at raining and being cold at night and stuff, but when it when it snows like that and there's snow on the ground, these people just find it really difficult to get a warm and um, to get a warm mm. inside them. So very much yeah, I love but- I love the snow. Snow's good fun. Um but you know, it's a difficult it's a difficult place for people to be when they're homeless. Absolutely, man. It's a nightmare. That's the, this is the time you wanna really reach out and get to them in it when the when the chips are down and it's it's cold as ice, literally. Yeah, definitely. It's I mean oh any time of the year it's it's no good having homeless people, but certainly in the winter months it's you know, that that's when most lives are lost is when Yeah. It's in the winter, so yeah, definitely. No. That's it, man. Well, well done for what you're doing anyway, mate. It's awesome, and that, it doesn't go unnoticed. And i just like to point out as well, uh, just as another pat on the back for you, really, from, from me and my lot down in Wales, um, there's been loads of positivity from people who've listened to the podcast you were on and everything, saying what a top bloke you are and everything, and how admirable it is what you're doing and what a fantastic story you've got. So kudos for that, my friend. Brilliant! Thanks very much for that. I really do appreciate the support I get in Wales. Um, it, it, it came a little bit unexpected um, because because I was donating all the profits from my book to just Scotland. I, I I sort of thought that the rest of the UK may um, ignore me a little bit, and it was very clear from early on the massive support that Wales was going to show me from. The, the homeless charities that you guys have down there from book sales people joining on onto my Facebook and sharing my posts on Facebook and you know then realising that you know all these people are Welsh it's just amazing I love it Brilliant mate we're not a bad bunch and we'd always support you we do love the Scots just uh, just not in a game of rugby that's all but uh, <laughs> we, we won't go there will we <laughs> No, I mean that shouldn't be. That's not the topic of tonight's discussion. No, so I think we should just... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's a, that's another one for another day, mate. That is. Um, I so obviously yeah, like I said, I've been following you. Um, I always keep an eye on what you're up to, what you're doing, great stuff. But I seen recently there's been a bit of negativity. What's what's that all about? Um, was that on Facebook? I think it was on Facebook. I read something that you'd had some negative comments or some people um, just just doubt us, really, just just doubting what you're doing and everything. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it's the nature of social media that the that's the bad side. Yeah, that is the bad side. And unfortunately, you always get it somewhere. You always get the odd one. Yeah, and it's you know, people. I've I've had it. I've, it's not been too bad, to be honest for the year that I've been on social media but you know it's it, it's regular that people come on and feel the need to mock me for the way I look or question my story or have something negative to say because I was in the army you know people that are obviously against the the British Army and again soldiers they feel they need to come on and tell me um, you know tell me that I'm not a very nice person because I was in the British Army and it's I mean they're obviously the, the, the language that they use is a lot stronger than that uh, yeah yeah. you know they make threats and stuff but to, to be honest I anticipated that before I embarked on this journey on social media, I know that there would be people who would still call me a smackhead. Mm. There would be people that would still call me a junkie. There would be people who would still have negative things to say because I was a British soldier. You know, and I, I, I was fully aware before I started. Fortunately, it's not been as bad as probably what I thought it was going to be. Uh, um, touch wood I don't want you know I don't want to jinx that but these people come out and try and sway me from my journey 
try and make me feel down and stuff. But I've got it under control. I'm in a good mental health place right now where I initially get very angry, like everyone, because I'm just human. I get I get angry. I get a little bit sad that people are doing that. But very quickly now, I um, I'm learning to you know just just ignore these people. Oh, I pity them in a sense as well that they're having mm, absolutely you know they're having to go into social media. Um, they don't know who I am. Five minutes after they posted a nasty comment to me, they are posting a nasty comment to someone else, and they are disregarding me completely so it would make no sense for me to allow this one person who doesn't know who I am has never met me say something horrible to me and then I end up going being depressed for the rest of the day it just exactly mate it just doesn't work um but unfortunately so many people allow these trolls um to affect their lives and it's so sad there's been suicides that have been caused due to people on social media trolling other people, and it's just it's just a sad state of affairs. But I genuinely do pity them because how sad must their lives be if they've got nothing better to do than say horrible things to people that they've never met? Well, that's it. What, what are they? They're just trolls, keyboard warriors, online bullies, basically, is what they are, mate. You know, and. You know, to, to to thrive on bringing other people down to make that your sole purpose in life, just makes, in my eyes, makes some pathetic excuses of human beings. To be honest, and I, I do pity them when they have to look at themselves in the mirror for doing that sort of shite. Yeah, definitely, mate. Definitely, I'm the same. Yeah, definitely pity them. Yeah, well, we know what to do with them. Ignore them. Just another kink in the armor. Let go and move on, brother. Let go and move on, innit? Yeah, definitely. Top man. Well, the book is obviously available. Heroin to Hero is available on Amazon. Twelve ninety nine for the paperback. Nine ninety nine for the Kindle edition. Is that correct? Have I got my facts right? <laughs> yes, you do. Yeah, I've got it. Spot on. Good, 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 good. Excellent. Um, so obviously, Paul, you're you're Scottish. You're my Celtic brother. You're my. <laughs> Uh, newly adopted Scottish cousin, I think that's what we call ourselves now, don't we? Yes, that's it. Your Scottish cousin. Excellent stuff. Well, from following you on social media, I've been looking at some of your readings and everything, and one story particularly interested me. I think you know where I'm going. Yeah. Um, so, you're Scottish, obviously English is your first language, but you also speak a bit of French, or so you thought, yeah? Can you uh, just, just tell me a story? Go on. So... I took French at school and I didn't pay that much attention but I picked up some words so throughout my life I when I hear French some words like bonjour I think oh I, I speak French so <laughs> when when I joined the army I I knew that I was going to be traveling the world and stuff um, but most of the the journeys that we had were to France so and amongst the boys and stuff we actually went and done a, an exercise with the French paras the, the it was I think a two week two week thing and I had a conversation with a couple of these paras these French paras and yeah. I was just chatting they could speak good English so I says do you know in Scotland, like we say, you know, you you, you know the word is friend, like we are. Friends. Yeah. But I, I I sometimes call my friends mates and pals. Like that's my mates and that's my pals. I says, do do the French have a word? Do you know? Do you have an alternative word like that that you use for your close friends and stuff? He says, yeah, of course. I says, oh, please teach me. So. <laughs> we had a cup of tea, we sat down we exchanged some army memorabilia and stuff and they were really friendly and, it's, and then they proceeded to teach me some French so I was fair away with learning these new French phrases and I wanted to share the knowledge with all the army guys so 
that um, exercise ended, we went back to the UK. And then very soon after, we went to Val d'Isere, skiing. Okay, yeah. In the French Alps. And I started passing round all my French phrases that I'd learned to all my army friends. We were in the bar and nightclubs and stuff, and we were at the bar asking for drinks, and we were trying to use as many French phrases as as we could remember. Um, well, just sort of, sort of like the, to fit in with a local sort of thing, and just uh, just show a bit of respect. Like yeah, that, because I, I do believe that when you go to another country, you should make a little bit of an effort to sort of learn the language certainly words like hello goodbye thank you um yeah I, I i agree with that i do that i go to cyprus a lot and uh i, I start i was thinking about moving out there um obviously it's, it's not on the cards at the moment um but yeah i picked up a, a bit of greek then i did just uh they all speak english out there but like you say it's just polite isn't it? it's, it's courteous just to, to give a little bit back to them and, and just show you've made a bit of an effort really but yeah i see where you're going and Obviously, people, when you're over there, they appreciate it. People, when they hear my broad Scottish accent, trying to speak French, they laugh. You know? <laughs> they do laugh. So, yeah. the, so you say, bonjour, or bonjour, monsieur, you know, je m'appelle, Paul, and things. And, and, and they get their kill at that because they can hear, obviously, the Scottish broad accent coming through. Yeah, coming straight through. Yeah. So when we went to Val d'Isere skiing, on the coach on the way there, I was like, right guys, right, see when we go to the bar and, we, and when you're out and about, instead of saying, mon ami, mon ami is my friend. But in, Scot okay, in, in yeah. Scotland, in the UK, we don't really use my friend so much. It's either your mates or your pals. And I've learned, mm -hmm. I've learned this new, I've learned this new sentence and stuff. So if you, if you, you see people that you like and you're getting on with, you say mon pod. So, so it would say bonjour, bonjour mon pod, or au revoir mon pod, which is goodbye my friend. It's the same, but yeah. you're, saying, you're saying goodbye, goodbye me. Like, so it's just like, just, just, just like a term of endearment really then? Yeah. So we were out the first few nights and we were in the bars and I heard all my friends saying it and I was going to the bar ordering drinks and I was using it. Um, and people were laughing. I thought they were laughing the fact that they could hear a Scotsman trying to speak French. That's what yeah. that's what I thought they were laughing at. And when I went up to, I went up skiing, and I got stuck on the top of a mountain because <laughs> I couldn't ski. I had been out drinking whiskey the night before. Um, oh God! And I missed the training. I was supposed to go on a day training to teach me how to ski and I missed it because I was steaming drunk. So So hang on, let me stop you. So what did you do? Did you just wing it? <laughs> yeah, so I just I, I woke up I woke up in the morning. It was a uh, half past six. Um but to be in three ranks stood outside. And I'd got up at half past six. And I was still drunk because I'd had whiskey. What? Been there, done that. <laughs> so the sergeant major came over and says, um, Bogey. And I was like, Aye, sir. He says, Were you in the sauce last night? And I was like, <laughs> Yeah, we were down at the nightclub and, all, and and stuff. And he was like, Are you still pissed? And I was like, <laughs> No, nah, I don't think so, sir. And he's like, He just walked right over to me. He went, You're still blazing. He says, The company commander will have a word with you. Away you go back to the room. So I went back. I ended up going swimming. I ended up going swimming instead. Um, yeah. So I'd missed that day's training, and the following day, when I went to meet the instructor who had been out with the rest of the guys the day before, he was a wee bit peed off with me, understandably. Um, yeah. Like, oh, here's the piss head coming, and I went over oh, <laughs> and stuff. It, it didn't hold any rank over me and stuff, but um, he was a civilian. But he had a bit of hard time. He says, "Right, well, we're going up the slopes today." And I was like, "Right, okay." He says, "Are you going to you skied before?" And I said, "No, never. 
I'll pick it up. I promise. <laughs> I'll put the I'll put the effort in and I'll and I'll I'll pick it up. <laughs> and how did that end? <laughs> well, very very quickly, I realised that I wasn't going to be able to ski. Um, just no through. It wasn't through any lack of trying. I was trying my hardest. Every time I opened the skis up and I started to pick up momentum coming down the baby slope, um, I fell because <laughs> I was I was worried that the more momentum I picked up on the slope, I, I, did, I wasn't quite sure about how to stop and I didn't want to be going 30, 40 miles an hour down the slope and then fall on my bum. So yeah. I would get to 5 or 10 miles an hour and then crap myself and then fall on my bum. Um, yeah, take a dive. Just man. took a dive and that was my way of stopping. It was like, try and put your skis at the front together and I was watching people doing that and I was like, it looks easy. So... Oh, it looks simple. It looks simple when you see other people. Yeah, and then I was just, you know, you know, I just kept trying and trying, and then that was in the morning, and then the rest of the guys were all moaning. They wanted to go higher up. They wanted to go up on the higher slope. So we went. It was fine. You know, there was a lot of falling, but I kept getting back up. I made it there, and go up on the lifts. You know, you go up in the lifts and stuff, and we were going up high, and. The higher we got, obviously, the steeper the hills were com- becoming. And yeah. I was holding everyone back. So there was eight guys with another instructor away on ahead. They were miles in front of me. And me and this, stru- this instructor, who didn't really like me very much, were at the back. And he stuck with me for the whole time, tried to get, you know, tried to make it easier for me and keep, keep <laughs> teaching me. So we got all the way up. And we were on the way to the black slopes. I didn't know until after that the black slopes are for advanced skiers. Uh, <laughs> the death slopes, are they? Yeah. But what happened was we were we were on approach to the black slopes and a storm came in. Oh great. So just gets better and better. When he says because halfway up I said oh, should we not turn back? Because I'm not gonna be able to catch the, I'm not gonna be able to catch everyone up. Can we just turn back? They went, no, we'll continue up. And there is a ski lift, and the ski lift will bring us back down. So that was the plan. Okay. So I remember getting up there, I remember the storm coming in. Visibility just went away, and the snow started, the wind, and he had a bright um, orange jacket on. And I remember just watching, following him, maybe about two metres behind him, just staying close to him. And Yeah. On the approach to the lift, the lift had closed. Um, it was, I think it was five o'clock, the, the, the ski lift was due to close, and we, we were late. We were late getting there. And once we got there, the guy went on the French walkie-talkie, started talking shit and everything. <laughs> and I said to the instructor, what's going on? He said, well, the lift, because we took so long to get up there. So... Um, the the they sent a snowmobile up just to get me. Yeah. The I remember the snowmobile arriving and the boy was really really angry. He was French and he couldn't speak English. Um, he, he had a face of thunder, so he threw me on the back of the snowmobile, threw my skis <laughs> into the back, and from the offset. He went full throttle down the side of the mountain, like not even, not even, um, you know, slowly getting up to speed. He just pulled up <laughs> and I nearly came off the back. <laughs> How were you feeling at this time? What was going through your mind? You know, I, like some people think I am dramatic, but I thought I might die. Like, like <laughs> literally, yeah, I was so high up, and I remember looking down at Val de Sierra and I could see like lights, and you know, I was like. Like we are really high up, and mm. the 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 steepness of the the hill, I was almost piggybacking him. Oh, I was almost. So how how safe did you feel on that? No, when, scale of one to ten, one being very unsafe, ten being super safe. Lucky if I give it two. Like Jeez. I, when 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 he when he took off full throttle, um, although I was on the back of him because of the momentum when he took off, 
I almost I almost went off the back of the snowmobile. But oh I, had, God. I had like a little crate on the back where they put my skis in. And I was holding on to his waist. I gripped onto his jacket for dear life. <laughs> and when he went full throttle, my hands came off his jacket because of the force. <laughs> but I managed to grab the, the crate at the back of the snowmobile. And with, yeah. with all my strength, white knuckle, I held onto that until we got moving, snowmobile, like it was it was flat out um it didn't take us very long at all to get down yeah i, I was about to ask how long was the journey was it seconds yeah. minutes yeah half hour couple of what? minutes couple of minutes they hadn't gone full throttle um we were down at the bottom and i remember getting off the snowmobile and i thought like i really appreciated them coming up and getting me i really did because i genuinely did had i was fearful when i was stuck up there and I heard, mm. you know, when he was on the walkie-talkie, it seemed like there was something really wrong. So I was like, I'm an, I could be in trouble here. So when I got yeah. off, um, and I was saying to the I was saying to the, the the guy, Mercy, kept saying, Mercy, Mercy, Monpod, and he looked like he wanted to punch me. Yeah. And I, thank you, my friend. Yeah, I've seen him. I'm only saying thank you, my friend. But I thought that, um. It was obviously just the situation him having to come and get me that he wanted to punch me, and yeah, he was he was just a little pissed off that he had to make a journey that he hadn't banked on, yeah. Yeah, and then you know I went back, um, everybody was all laughing at me and stuff, and um, that was fine. Then that night it was in the tobacco shop, and um, queuing, I waiting on the in the queue to get my tobacco, and bearing in mind this was three or four days into the trip by then, and yeah, I went ask for my cigarettes and I says um, mer mer merci mon pod when I, when I gave the, I think it was a girl behind the, behind the counter she gave me my change and she laughed and she says um, do you know what you just called me I said yeah, yeah <laughs> my friend <laughs> and she says that's one, that's one word for it yeah and she says no no and she was like she was nice about it she says no 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 she said, no, you just called me your whore. Oh, God, man. And, <laughs> and, and honestly, it was, it was that, as soon as she said that, everything clicked as to why everyone was frowning at me or laughing at me when I was saying it. Yeah, um, everything came together. You know, instantly, and I was thinking, I've told 40 or, 40 or 50 of my army pals to go around <laughs> using the same phrase and they've gone around calling everyone my whore. Um, Brilliant stuff. Did anyone come back to you and, uh, and complain that they'd had a, a black eye or something? No, there was no, like, there was no repercussions whatsoever that I know of, um, certainly for, for that phrase anyway. But it was just one of those things where I was like, I'm so gullible. Like, I could have got a French dictionary or probably <laughs> done it that way, but I've took the word of a French soldier <laughs> and he's like you know he's he's trying to teach me the lingo that he would use with his yeah, friends <laughs> he was having a laugh when he was having a laugh he was having me on and you know <laughs> that that realization that I'd been going around saying that so I went and told all the guys I went and told them straight away you d oh you did didn't yeah. you I, see see I, I wouldn't have see I would I would have let him carry on and I would have just uh, you know sorted myself out I would have and just, just followed them kept a close watchful eye on them <laughs> when they are doing their French vocabulary at the bar in the tobacco shop or wherever else and I would just watch them dive <laughs> yeah and it was like they, they weren't a surprise they just says Bogey you are an idiot like I'll be, I, I was I was at the bar last night and I was using that I was using that phrase Brilliant. and no wonder everybody's been laughing at me and guys have been frowning at me when I've been <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, from what I know, there wasn't any, there wasn't, there wasn't any fighting. Certainly no, certainly no, because of that, <laughs> because of that, I yeah. don't believe there was any fighting. But yeah, it's just one of those things, just gullible and. No, mate. <laughs> that's, that's that's why we we're all guilty of that though in foreign countries, and we you know we we literally we're out of our elements. You know we we pretty trusting as well as as a nation. I think we we're, we're a pretty trusting nation when we go abroad and whatnot. 
and God knows what I've been told. I've been probably been calling the, the Greeks all sorts and not even knowing about it, you know. But uh, <laughs> oh man, it's a it's a great story though. Um, that's that's obviously that's that's featured more in depth in your book. That one is it as well. Yeah, I, like the story is in the book, um, but obviously my book is relatively short. Yeah, and there was quite a lot of things that happened in the army that I think I've realised since that when, I, when I'm actually telling the story like I am to you now yeah. I can go more into depth about about the story in the book I, I, I mention uh, um, roughly briefly what happened and stuff but there was you know there was a few I don't want to spoil the book I don't want to give away too much from the book yeah, but, yeah, don't, no, don't, man, don't give too much away. People got to go and buy it, man. It's for a good cause as well. Let's not forget. Yeah, but I mean, there was a time that um, I thought I was going to drown, and I genuinely thought I was going to drown. There was a time that I almost thought um, being stuck on the top of that mountain in Val de Serre. Um and there was a time that I got bit by a horse. <laughs> Great. So. <laughs> I won't say any more than that, but <laughs> no, no, that's great. That's good enough. I'm intrigued. I still, I must confess, I still haven't got it yet. I am going to get it. Okay, I'm going to get the hard copy, and uh, I am going to read it. And I just haven't got round to round to getting it yet. Uh, work and everything. Um, but yeah, I'll certainly be getting it, man. Uh, especially now if that I can, I know that I can read about my Scottish cousin being bitten by a horse. That's fantastic. It's worth getting just for that, if nothing else. <laughs> yeah, and it's you know, <laughs> horses are big animals. They are, mate. I'm terrified of them. There used to be a horse in the field when I was going off the school bus. You could walk right up this massive hill through the streets to get home, or you could take a shortcut through the field. But this massive stallion would chase you, and one day I dived into the brambles I did to get away from it. Bloody cuts and grazes all over me there was I was picking brambles out of my ass for weeks <laughs> but uh, yeah I, I'm not horses are lovely to look at from behind the fence though you know it's uh, yeah they, they do freak me out they are massive yeah they're, they're, such, they're such big um, such big animals and you know I've watched horse racing and stuff my whole life and the jockeys make it look easy um, I've watched cowboys you know cowboy films and Anybody that you ever see on the television makes horse riding look easy. <laughs> yeah. And they do, don't they? <laughs> and it, for me, it just wasn't the case. And I don't know, I don't know if it was just my luck. I, I know, <laughs> like, I was quite nervous. I was quite nervous about going horse riding in the Canadian Rockies. Um, yeah. Really not. Was it was it a, was it a choice thing? Did you have a choice, or was it was it just part of what was you know put in front of no, you, so, put in place for you? So there's a your adventure training. You get the choice of a package where you can go skydiving. I yeah. have no intention of jumping out a perfectly good working plane. Uh, I'm with you there. That seemed the most adrenaline filled, and that was what most of the guys did pick. You had white white water rafting. Um, I had that that situation when I almost drowned in France, which I'm not going to. But um, so I didn't really want to be in the water. I can swim and everything, but I'm not overly comfortable. I almost drowned when I was a young kid, and that sort of followed me through life I didn't learn to swim until I was in secondary school at the age of 13 or 14 which is mm, okay. quite late for you know my, all my brothers could swim at the age of 4 or 5 and I was because I had a, a situation when I was younger um, I'd never learned to swim so once, once yeah. I learned to swim I got it but I just didn't fancy it rock climbing and ice climbing and that, those sorts of things thought I did enjoy that but I've been rock climbing before yeah I've never been on the back of a horse before and it looked easy yeah well like I say I, I liked all the horse racing and stuff and I thought well every, every, 
the jockeys and things make it look so easy. So I thought, I think I'd quite like that. That seems to. <laughs> I think that seems to be the most sort of laid back out of, out of the things. Not you know, white water rafting would be adrenaline filled, um, so would guy diving. So I thought, yeah, I'll go, I'll go horse riding. And having never been on a horse before, when I got close to the horses and seen them all playing up and kicking out and things, and got. <laughs> you got some of the stories from the cowboys or the wranglers they called them um, they were yeah. like you know be very careful Paul like these animals if they kick out we've we've had people die because they've been kicked in the head from a horse and you oh great I bet that really instilled you full of confidence yeah that. and they were like whenever you're approaching pro- approach the horse from the front whenever you're working your way around the horse you always stay close to the horse. Never be mm. any more than a meter away, because if it is going to kick out at you, if you are a couple of meters away from that, the back of your horse and it kicks out, it's going to get full force. Um, the hoof is going to be full force into you. So stay very close. So I was like, right, okay. So you know, and I've done it, and the they show you how to put the saddle on. They show you how to do everything. Um, I'm yeah. I'm not going to say any more because it would sort of uh, <laughs> with, with the with the book. Um, it's one of the, probably the, the funniest things that. Well, <laughs> brilliant! Not, I I can't wait to read it myself. That story alone. It's not funny. Really it's not funny for me. You understand. Um, <laughs> but for other people that have read the book, they find that hilarious, and they find the fact that. Um, I nearly got stuck up the mountain hilarious, I find the fact that I nearly drowned hilarious and it's like you know that's great, thanks very much that you find all that really funny <laughs> um, but for me at the time I was genuinely genuinely fearful for my life, you know it wasn't like I was just being dramatic I genuinely thought that I was in serious trouble um, I love I love going horse riding, I'm glad I'm glad that I've done it, that's what that's what the army allowed me to do was to travel by experience different things that otherwise I would never have had the opportunity and mm. bearing in mind I've come from a heroin addict lifestyle um, where I thought my life was over the, the, the thought of me going on to be a soldier and travel the world and go horse riding in the Rockies and go skiing in Val d'Isere and go sailing, you know, go sailing and do do all these crazy things. Like, that that was just a, a dream that would never... Mm. It's brilliant. It's, it's, man, it is, an, I know I said it last time, it's an awesome journey. It is to go from the darkest of places, right, then to have all these opportunities, which you worked for yourself to get, by the way, all right? So give yourself a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of respect and a little bit of kudos for that as well. Um, it's just a, a, a fantastic story, which is one of the reasons I, I love talking to you. And you're also easy to talk to, by the way, which which always helps. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's amazing, man. You've done some amazing things, you know, along your journey. And I can't wait to read all about it. Brilliant. Thank you. And it's... You, I, I've, I've actually started working on the second book and it's being an author in itself is one of those things that I suppose a little bit like joining the army um, when I reflect when I reflect now on life how my life is right now it's it is a pretty crazy journey that I've been on when mm. When I speak to strangers about my life, um, they all seem quite amazed. Yeah. Some people even doubt it, you know? And I totally understand that. I totally understand why people will be like, well, he can't have been a heroin addict for seven years and then went on and stood outside Buckingham Palace guarding the Queen. He couldn't have done that. That's that's nonsense. That's false. Um, you know... And that's just, I understand exactly why some people may think that. 
and it's totally fine. I've got um, ways and means of proving my whole story. You know, I'm all my family's still here. All my old friends are still here. All my old um, army captains and majors and sergeant majors and stuff. That they, they, these people are real. It's not a story that I've just made mm. up. And they can verify. Of course, it's not, man. Of course, they can not. verify my story as and when it's needed. But the, being an author is something. I had someone message me two days ago, and they yeah. just said, "That's absolutely amazing what you're doing with the sleeping bags." I seen you going up to Aberdeen with the sleeping bags for the homeless. It's absolutely amazing, and I just put, "Thanks very much, mate. I really appreciate it." That was just my reply. And then they came back and they said, like, not only that, you're extremely brave to have wrote a book about your life. Not not so much about the army side of things, but more about the drug side of things, about being a being a heroin addict and being suicidal, being he- heavily depressed, having mental health issues and writing about it for other people to read. And it's like, like you're so incredibly brave for doing that. And I remember reading it and thinking I suppose I am. You know, do I, mate? Not not just brave, but inspiring as well. You know, others can take inspiration from your story. I think that it's 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 very humbling when when people that I've never met before say those sorts of things to me. Um, mm. it, you know, instantly it sort of makes me think about my life, and the way that I've lived my life is that I've not. Because it's been my life being the heroin addict, it's been my life in recovery and taking up boxing, doing weights, getting extremely fit. Um, same with the army and everything since the army and becoming an author. Because I'm sort of you know living this life day by day, I don't really see what I'm doing as anything special, and I just you know I just I just think that. I'm just being honest. I'm not really doing anything special, but it's it, it's very humbling when people tell me that I am special for and I am brave for sharing my whole life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, sharing everything so honestly, and I, I suppose you know it is. It's amazing because ultimately, I am just about helping people, not just the homeless. But I want to help the addicts as well. And Mm. when, you know, that was my first thought was helping the addicts. But what I've found in the last year on social media from hundreds of people that have sent me personal messages, that these are mums and dads and brothers and sisters and aunties and uncles of heroin addicts. And yeah. they've bought my book and they've read it. Then they've messaged me to say thank you. And when I was like, there's no need to thank me. I want to thank you for buying my book because for supporting me and stuff. And I, I usually get like maybe a few hundred words at times. You know, it's like half a book in itself, the messages that people send me. And they get they give me their life story and they say, Well, do you know what, Paul? Like I lost I lost my brother, for instance. I lost my brother two years ago to a heroin overdose and stuff and he was a, he wasn't in a good place and it was really bad and actually when I read your book it helped me realise a little bit more about the mindset of a heroin addict. And I just feel so much better now for, for reading it. And I think, well, that's amazing as well, suppose, because I'm not just helping current addicts right now. I'm not just maybe helping maybe recovering addicts right now. I'm also helping people who have never taken a drug in their life that have had to watch their loved ones from a distance be their lives be destroyed by drugs. And 
if I can give them some sort of comfort as well, then opening myself up on social media and writing a book, writing a second book and, and doing all that sort of stuff, then it's definitely worthwhile. And it definitely, definitely outweighs any trolls or negativity that comes my way. 100%, mate. 110%, definitely. And, you know, it's giving them comfort, not just comfort, but perhaps in some cases, some answers as well to those questions that have just been, you know, exercising their mind for all these years, you know? Yeah, definitely. And that... But yeah, man, so... No, go you on. go, go. <laughs> No, I was just gonna say. Um, is it before we do wrap up? As uh, you know, I've got a another thing on at six o'clock myself. I I know you've uh, you've got your bits and pieces to do as well. Can you tell us any more about the second book? Yeah. Or is it is it hush hush? No, for now? no, not not at all. So basically, the first book is Paul Bogey as a young boy growing up, going at, um, going into drugs. Is in a gang, then broke free from drugs, got extremely fit, joined the army, um, had an accident, got medically discharged, and had a breakdown, had another problem with addiction, and then wrote the book. But as writing the book, broke free, and that was it. That's the end. You know, that's that's my life in a nutshell up until that point which was the be- which yeah. was the beginning of lockdown um but since then i am 10 months completely drug free i sit here right now with a with a crushed spine and i'm in a lot of pain every day and i'm not on any drugs whatsoever so that's sort of the start of the second book is writing about that transition again from coming off my prescription medication mm. to um, the things that I began to do with regards to helping the homeless building up social media um, my anxiety is about that I've done maybe this. I think this is my 16th podcast Hey, happy sixteenth birthday, man! <laughs> yeah. So you know, I've been I've been sharing my story um, in <laughs> India, all across America, all across the UK, and you know, being able to reach out to people like yourself, like your listeners, that otherwise mm. would have no idea who Paul Bogey is, no idea anything about him no idea they had a book and now hopefully listening to your show you know like it's already proved over the last few months you know that people down in mm. Wales buying the book and it's that is quite emotional for me no I bet it is man brilliant it's, it's a, an absolutely amazing accomplishment mate it's fantastic Be proud. so that's really the, that's really the, in a nutshell that is the second book is continuing to tell my story of the last year but I have a few milestones that I'm wanting to hit before I finish the second book I'm doing Mm. a book I'm going to be doing a book tour this year across Scotland and suppose at the end end of that there's a few things that I'm wanting a few things I'm hoping will happen this year um, once there's a big enough milestone, brilliant, mate, I, brilliant. Would you th- would you think about extending that book tour to Wales at all? Just pop down, even if it's just a one day or something, or a weekend. Or yeah. Something? So I've already made some arrangements to come down to Wales. I have got, I think it's four, four or five people who have invited me down to Wales so far. One is to do a podcast, but. I'm, I'm, pod, I'm podcast daft, as you can probably tell. So, absolutely, man. Yeah, you're on the ball. So, when I got an invite to go down to Wales, I was like, yeah, of course. And because Wales had showed me so much support, um, I had reached out to my my other new Welsh cousins, and excellent. Said I'm wanting to do Scotland first. I'm wanting to do the book tour of Scotland first, but then I'm going to do UK 
and I will be down in Wales and I will be spending some time down in Wales and I'd be love to meet meet up, have a cup of tea and after lockdown we can, you know, things get back to a form of normality. We can hook up, we can have a cuppa, we can have a laugh. I'll bring some I'll Brilliant, bring mate. some books down, we'll do some book signing days and the cities and stuff and hopefully by then people you know, some people have bought the book and bring the book to me to sign for them. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's just that, it's just amazing, you know, to, be, to have an opportunity to go and do things like that and keep spreading the word because all the money that I'm generating through the book, I am building this year. I'm starting, build, starting to build in Scotland for forever homes for the homeless. Um, Mate, that's 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 fantastic. That is, that is such a great thing to do. Like, what a magnificent individual you are. Like, the sleeping the great. sleeping bags were only were only temporary. They can only ever be temporary. So, my I wrote a business plan right after writing the first book, and I've wrote a business plan. I've been invited into Parliament and the Scottish Parliament to discuss that and see how we take it forward. And obviously, with my drug experience and stuff, they're very keen to hear my thoughts on that as well. So, I'm super excited for this year, you know. And you know, the the more awareness that I can raise through doing podcasts all over the world and being on social media, which allows me to reach people all over the world, then hopefully, the book sales the book sales are high enough that I can build these forever homes sooner rather than later. Brilliant, mate, brilliant. Well, our, our listenership extends now uh, upon looking at our statistics to Brazil, New Zealand, USA, Canada, Austria, Thailand, and obviously the UK as well. It might have been a couple of other places in there as well, but, uh, you know, I don't know who's listening to us out there, but... Uh, with someone so uh happy day so you you're crossing the pond with us as well mate. brilliant amazing brilliant stuff my man all right paul well uh i'm gonna love you and leave you for now my friend it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you again like i said at the top of the show it feels like i've known you for donkey's years <laughs> um but uh yeah once once lockdown is over come down and see us when if you are down in wales make sure you look us up in merthyr tidville as well okay because that's where i am and uh yeah we'll hook up and have a cuppa have a chat and you can sign the book, which I will have by then, all right? Perfect. I most definitely will, and I'll look forward to it too. Top man. Likewise. Well, good luck with the new book and everything, and good luck with everything you're doing. Keep plodding along, mate. You're doing awesome things, and I will speak to you soon, no doubt. Brilliant. Thanks very much, mate. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome, brother. Look after yourself, my Scottish cousin. Speak to you soon. Stay safe. Bye-bye. <laughs>